So I get the honor of introducing Doc Henley, who is on our March issue cover. You have one in your bag. This bartender from North Carolina decided to meet one of the world's greatest challenges. He raised enough money to dig wells in Sudan, Ethiopia, Uganda, India, Cambodia, and an orphanage in Peru. Doc Henley really is a hero who had the courage to meet a challenge and believe that one person can really change the world. 1.1 billion people in the world don't have access to clean water. My efforts are going to be a drop in the bucket. But if I had never taken that step because it was too big of a problem, then we wouldn't be anywhere right now. From Boone, North Carolina, meet Doc Henley. Through his Wine to Water program, this bartender provides clean, sustainable water to thousands worldwide. Everything from when you're nominated uh, to getting through the top ten to being in the Kodak Theater could not have made me and everybody that was around me feel more special. I'm very proud to be a part of this group. My name is Doc Kinley. I'm a 2009 CNN hero. I started the organization Wine to Water. Doc Henley calls himself proof that anyone, even a tattooed keg tapper, can cure the world. Will you please welcome Doc? Um, so uh, anybody that knows me, and there's a few out there because I am from North Carolina, uh, knows that I, I do have a little bit of a hard time starting out with a video like that. And it's because CNN, when they made it, their job was to make me look as perfect as possible. Um, and the problem with that is I'm not very perfect at all. I'm actually quite imperfect. Um, I'm a little bit average, maybe maybe even below average as well. Um, and the problem with having a view of yourself like I do, uh, of myself that way, is that um, I had a hard time growing up because I came from a family of extremely exceptional people. And I'm pretty sure every one of them was, was absolutely perfect in every way, shape, or form. So it was hard for me growing up because my family, they had basically three measures of success that, that let you know that you're going to get the pat on the back from my dad or my granddaddy or my mom uh, and let you know you're going to do well in life. And the first one in my family was, uh, hands down, was, was athletics. You know, if you were good in sports, you're going to get that pat on the back. Good job, son. Good job, daughter. Whatever. Good to go. And uh, so I tried and miserably failed in quite a few of them. Uh, the first was football. Uh, I knew pretty soon I wasn't going to impress my granddaddy who ended up playing football for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, uh, so I knew I wasn't going to reach that level. Uh, my uncle also, he played for the Atlanta Falcons. Um, I knew I wasn't going to impress anybody with, with football because my butt really never left the bench. You know, so I realized that wasn't really an official position, bench warmer, you know, so, so that didn't work out so well. So then I started playing basketball, and I thought I was getting pretty good and, you know, getting pretty confident in my, my basketball abilities. Um, well, then my younger brother, by, by four years, he turned out to be six foot nine. Um, so you can imagine, you know, you know, your 14, 13-year-old brother dunking on you when you're 17 years old is not really good for your confidence. So then I thought, okay... For God's sakes, what about golf? I mean, it's a ball and a stick. I mean, come on. I get to look at beautiful scenery. I can, I can do golf. So I, I picked up the golf clubs. I started playing and practicing. And I got, you know, from what I thought, pretty decent. And then my cousin, uh, who I roomed with in college before I dropped out, um, he, he uh, is on the PGA Tour right now. His name is Lucas Glover. Uh, he won the U.S. Open four years ago in New York and Bethpage. So... I quickly realized I, would not go, I was not going to impress anyone in my family with my sports uh, abilities. So then I thought, what about my academic abilities? You know, that was number two. If you do well in school, you're going to get that pack. You know, usually from my mom saying, you know, you're going to do great things with your life. And, um, yeah, I would quickly realize that wasn't going to happen either. So um, average people like me, um, we make average grades. They call C's average for a reason, you know. So there was a lot of those in there. And then there was a lot of other letters well, that, that we won't talk about. But my sister was the opposite. She made all A's. And I think, it may have only happened once, but if she got a B on her report card, she would literally cry if she saw a B on her report card. If I saw a B on my report card, I would literally cry as well, but it was tears of joy that I actually made a B. You know, so I had learned it wasn't going to happen there with, that, with uh, academics. And then the whole other flip side of my family was the spiritual side. My, my dad was a, a preacher man growing up, 
and uh, and so the other way you can get the pat on the back is you know how religious you are or whatever and and I guess you, you may can tell by looking at me, um, I, I'm a bit of the black sheep of the family, and uh, if you put rules and regulations in front of me, I make it my life's mission to see how quickly and uniquely I could break every single one of those rules. And, uh, and so, because of all these things added up, I, most of my life I felt like I had absolutely nothing to offer the world. Like I was a failure in, in every way, shape, or form. Um, and so, like I said, I dropped out of my first semester of school. Um, I've been a pretty avid motorcycle rider most of my life. I hopped on my bike, took off across the country, and just went to be away from all of that. To be as far and fast away from, from measuring up to everyone else as I could. Because I felt like such a failure, and I had nothing to offer. Um, and so I hopped around from different states and different cities. I worked in, in barns and shoveled poop for a living and actually lived in a few barns along the way. And then I started picking up jobs in the service industry, um, waiting tables. Uh, and then I m moved my way up in some areas to where I could be a bartender, which money was a little better. Um, but I really started enjoying my job as a bartender as I got more of them because I really loved at the end of my day or the beginning of my day, depending on what shift I was at, if I got happy hour coming on, uh, say it's 5 o'clock and you got all these people coming in off their job, you got a white collar CEO of some company sitting next to a school teacher, next to uh, some blue collar construction worker, next to somebody that's just lost their job, and everybody was on the same playing field. Nobody was looking up or down at anybody else, judging anybody else, what color collar they got on, what job they just came from. Everybody was there just to have a good conversation, forget about their day, talk about the game on TV or politics or whatever. And I loved that about my job. I felt so at home there at the bar. And so I kind of embraced that life. And actually, my mama, she kept calling me on the road, please just come home and get a degree. Please try. You know, come back to North Carolina. So I decided I gave in just so she would stop nagging at me. So I came back, and I started going to North Carolina State University in Raleigh. Um, and, and I don't really, I can't really explain the shift that happened. A lot of people were like, so how did it go from there to why, why are you up here? How did you go from that to being on stage? And I don't really know how or why it all happened, but I can tell you, and I remember exactly when everything changed for me, my whole direction in life. I was getting ready to finish up my degree at North Carolina State. I had a semester left of school. I was still bartending uh, at, at a local Irish pub there in Raleigh. And I'm playing music as well. I play uh, old Johnny Cash and Merle Haggard songs and, and like some cover music. And uh, I just gotten done with a gig at the bar. Uh, and I was sitting down having a drink, and my best friend in, in the world at the time, her name's Tasha Sullivan, she came and she sits next to me, and she looks over, and she's like, is this it? Is this all you're going to do with your life? You know, you may somehow, God knows how, you're going to get a degree in, in a semester, and, uh, and you're just going to keep, <laughs> keep playing music and bartending the rest of your life? I'm like, yes. That's all I got. <laughs> That's all I want to do. I'm really excited that I'm not living in a barn anymore, to be honest with you. So I'm excited to be here. She didn't smile. She just kept looking at me. And she's like, you know, you have more to offer the world than what you're offering it right now. And she just kind of threw her money down and walked off out the door. And I remember kind of sitting there by myself for a while thinking about what she said. And I think maybe it was, as far as I can remember, it was one of the first times... I had somebody that I really cared about that much and trusted and respected say something like that to me, that they believed in me. They thought I had something to offer the world. And, uh, and so I remember I, I asked for a couple weeks off the bar, uh, and then I had two weeks off of, of school because I had Christmas break coming up. This was December of 2003. So I went off to Boone, which is where I live now, where my parents were living at the time, just up in the mountains to kind of get away and do some thinking. And it's, it's there that it kind of all happened. I remember I was in my bed one night. I couldn't really sleep. I was kind of half asleep, half awake. And uh, I couldn't get that phrase on the screen out of my head. It was stuck in my head over and over, wine to water, wine to water. And I remember waking up, you know, kind of looking around like this is kind of weird. This stuff doesn't happen to me. And then I grabbed a, a, a pad and a pen and I started writing it down on the pad because I actually write my own music as well. Uh, and so I was thinking, okay, wait, wait, wait a minute. This is how it happens for all those country music stars when they come up with their first single and it's going to top the charts. You know, this could be a really cool song. It's backwards of my favorite story that my daddy told me growing up. You know, I, I, I could do something with this. So I wrote it down on the page, wine to water. And right when I saw all the words written out on the page, like I kind of got this real nervous feeling. My insides kind of got all knotted up. And I'm like, you know, I think it's supposed to be more than that. I think, 
I think I'm supposed to know something, you know. And so I went down to my parents' computer, and I pulled up Google, and I started just searching online. And uh, I looked at the words, and I thought, well, you know, I don't need to, to look up anything about wine. I, I deal with it every day. I, but what about water? Maybe I'm supposed to know something about water. had no idea what I was getting ready to find out. Uh, so my first search was something like water issues or water problems or whatever. And the, the first thing that I saw was that uh, at that time it was 1.1 billion people with a B do not have access to clean drinking water. And I remember staring at that number for a long time and thinking about, you know, I'm not a math major, but I'm pretty sure there's only like 6 or 7 billion people in the world. And if over one of those billion doesn't have access to clean water, that's a huge number. I'm pretty sure that I would have heard about this by now. You know, so maybe these, this search, maybe these, these, this, this report is all messed up. And, and sure enough, though, another report from the United Nations, another report from the WHO, another report after report, over a billion people. And I just couldn't believe it. That's a huge number. And then the next one I saw was the one that really kind of got me. It, it was uh, that more children in our world died from, from dirty water and water-related diseases than anything else, anything. And then it listed the next three. The first was HIV AIDS. I'd heard plenty about that. Some of my favorite bands and musicians, they wear the red ribbons and they do the campaigns. So I knew all about number two. Number three was malaria. You know, I didn't know much about it, but I knew that it, it failed more soldiers uh, in Vietnam than bullets. I learned that in school. Uh, the last one was tuberculosis. And the next thing I read said that water kills more than all three of those combined together. Combined yet receives way less than 20% of the funding and the research and the exposure while the others receive over 80%. So I kept reading all this stuff and I couldn't understand why if it seemed to me that the water crisis was obviously the worst crisis facing our world. Why is no one doing anything about it? And um, so I took that pad and that pan and instead of writing some cheesy country song that maybe would have never gone anywhere anyway, um, I jotted down the concept for this organization that we have. And, and and in the beginning, it wasn't to be where we are now. Now we've just added our 17th country, which was the Philippines after the typhoon there. We've reached over 250,000 people with clean water around the world. Um, in the beginning, though, it wasn't to be where we are now. In the beginning, I, my thought was, you know, I wonder if I can just do one thing right with my life. You know, I wonder if I could, maybe I could host an event. Maybe I could turn this into some type of event. Maybe I could raise some money. Maybe I can help one family get a well or a water filter or maybe if I'm really lucky I can help one village. You know, that was the way it was in the beginning, like just very short-sighted. I wonder if I can take one step in the right direction with my life. And so I went back to the bar and I just kind of looked at the resources I had around me. Um, I'm sorry to say that I, I didn't really know much about planning events at the time. I had never really been to a fundraiser or an event before ever in my life. Um, but I just looked at the resources I had around me as a bartender. I'm like, I've got Number one, I got plenty of access to booze, which is really important if you want to have a successful event. <laughs> so I've got booze. I've got good you know, food I can get donated from the different restaurants that I've worked in. Um, you know, I can get a, a location given for free from a nightclub owner that I know. Uh, and I think I'd be willing to pro bono offer my musical abilities and services for some uh, entertainment. So before I knew it, I had you know, a music venue, you know, a, 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 booze, food, and, and about a month and a half, February of 2004, we held the very first wine to water event. And uh, we had about 300 people show up, uh, five or $6,000 was raised that night, and uh, about a month later we held another event, because uh, another restaurant owner came to that and was like, dude, that was awesome, let me, let me hold one in my place. Uh, so we held another one, another three or $4,000 come in, I opened a P.O. box and a bank account, people started sending in checks and, and wanting to support us, and before I knew it, I got an account that I'm sitting on that has like tens of thousands of dollars in it. And I'm kind of freaking out and I'm like, I have no clue how to get that account, how to get that money, how do I get it to these people? No clue. I've never been to Africa or Asia or wherever these people need help. You know, and uh, actually I look, look, look back a little later thinking maybe even I was doing something illegal because I didn't have any charity status or nothing. <laughs> I was like, sure, give me your money. Yeah, I'm gonna use it. So, we looked into it later. My CPA checked it out. We're, we're good to go. But how do we get the money to these people? You know, after a lot of thought and consideration, I decided I'd love to get to be the guy that goes and travels the world and saves little kids single-handedly, you know. Um, but I don't even know what I'm doing. So if I take that money that I've been raising 
I'll, I'll probably spend half of it on plane tickets and travel and, and, and then training and all that. I probably won't have anything left by the time I figure out what I'm doing. So why don't I just take the money and donate it to an already established organization? You know, why reinvent the wheel? So I, I did a lot of research. Some of y'all probably heard of a, a group also based out of Boone. Phenomenal organization, very large organization that has a lot of programs around the world. It's a group called Samaritan's Purse. Uh, based out of Boone. They do the shoe boxes at Christmas time. Uh, but they had a pretty huge water program that I learned about that I wanted to support. And also on top of that, over 92% of their money actually went to the field, which that was really important to me because I've worked hard to raise this money. So I went to them somehow. I, actually, my mom, through a friend of a friend, knows somebody over there. So somehow through them, I got a meeting with the head of all their international programs. Like, this is a pretty major guy. So I remember walking into the offices the first day at Samaritan's Purse, and I'm looking around. Everybody's got a suit and tie on, dressed up really nice. And, I mean, this is, this is my formal attire right here. This is, this is as good as it gets, you know. So I was probably in a T-shirt and jeans with holes in it. You know, I just got off my motorcycle, and I'm like, oh, geez, I don't really fit in here, you know. So I'm, like, covering up my tattoos. And, and then I get this guy's office, and he wasn't there yet. His name's Kenny Isaacs. And, uh, and so, of course, I had to snoop around a little bit. So I'm like walking around his office, like looking at his desk and, and looking on the wall. And the very first picture I see on the wall is him and the president of the United States at the time, George Bush, shaking hands and smiling and this handwritten letter from the president thanking him for his service. The next picture I see is like him and some tribal war leader I just saw on CNN. And then the next one's him and some other president of some other country. And I'm like, oh my gosh, who is this guy I'm getting ready to meet with? You know, I'm kind of getting really nervous and self-conscious and, and he comes in and he's like, how can I help you? You know, and, and when I get nervous, I talk really fast. So I was like, Mr. Isaacs, my, my name's Doc Kenley. I've raised like tens of thousands of dollars and I'm here to give that money today to you, sir. <laughs> you know, and he's like, slow down, Doc. So you, you're, uh, you're raising some money. I'm like, y yes, sir. He's like, you're, you're a bartender in Raleigh. I'm like, y yes, sir. He's like, you raised a decent amount of money, and you're here to give that to our organization today as a donation. I'm like, yes, that's what I meant. And uh, he's like, are you keeping any for yourself? You skimming off the top, putting any in your pocket? I said, well, no, sir. And he kind of looked at me for a little bit, and he was like, well, why are you doing this? Why would you do this? And I kind of thought for a while, and I just said, you know, I'm not really sure why. But all I know is in the last couple months, I feel like for the first time in my life, I actually might be able to have a positive impact on this world. And for the first time in my life, I actually feel like I'm a part of something that's bigger than myself. So if it's okay, I'm just going to go right back to my bar in Raleigh. I'm going to keep raising money. And every couple months, I'm just going to bring you a check uh, if you'll promise me that it's going to go to these people here. That's all I care about. As long as it's going to go to water, that's, my, that's the thing that I'm really interested in. And he said, I'll tell you what, I got a better idea. Why don't you finish your degree? I told him I was getting ready to graduate. And he said, why don't you quit the job at the bar? Why don't you come work for me? I'll send you anywhere in the world you want to go. It already seems like you know how to raise the money on this hand. If I can figure out how to help you get some field training, you can take those two when you come home and you can put them together and you can create your own organization that you've been dreaming about. And I almost fell out of my chair. I said, yes, of course, that would be awesome. And uh, so his next question is, where do you want to go? And I'm like, well, you know, I don't really know. I don't really know much about the world. It's a, it's a pretty large place. Uh, <laughs> so I tell you what, you just send me to the worst place on that map that you can think of, and we'll call it even. And, uh, and he kind of looked at me, did one of those like raised eyebrow things. He's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes, sir, I'm sure. And a lot of people think I was being brave or courageous by saying that. That's not the case at all. Actually, what I was thinking is if I've never really viewed myself as the most intelligent person in the world, even if you put me in the most god-awfulest place in the world, I'm pretty sure I can do a good job at that place. You know, so <laughs> that's what I was thinking. So he's like, well, the first one, you know, uh, I could send you to Afghanistan. It's pretty bad there. There's a war. Uh, you know, there's a water crisis. And, you know, we got a team on the ground that can kind of help you figure out what you need to do. He's like, there's another place that might be worse, though. Uh, it's uh, in the western region of Sudan. It's called Darfur. It's about the size of France. There's been a civil war going on there for years uh, that's now changed over to a genocide. 
uh, the government of, of this country, is, it's not a religious war, it's two Muslim groups fighting against each other. The government of this, of the, uh, this country is a nomadic Arab Islamic population, and they are now supporting the nomadic Arab uh, Islamic groups in Darfur, and they've funded them and given them weapons to kill all the local black African tribal folks that have been there for thousands of years that also are an Islamic group, they funded them to systematically extinguish them all or force them out, either one. So it's really bad. On top of that, there's a water crisis there. On top of that, it's in sub-Saharan Africa. If you go there, temperatures are going to be 120 degrees a lot of times, sometimes more, sometimes up to 130. Um, and on top of that, we don't have anyone on the ground there right now. You're going to be one of the first people. <laughs> so you're just going to kind of figure it out on your own. So I was like... <clears throat> See, war, genocide, desert, alone. <laughs> yep, that's the worst place in the world. You can send me there. So, six months after my very first event, this would have been August of 2004, uh, I was on a plane to Darfur. Uh, this is the very first camp that I worked in there called Marla Camp. Um, and I, I spent a year of my life in Darfur. And in that year... I, I think I learned more about myself and life in general in that year than all the, all the previous 24 years before that. And um, this is the first place that I went to. Uh, again, it's Marla, about eight to 10,000 people in this camp. I had a little point and shoot camera with me. And I remember the very first day I get there, I see this, uh, this scene. And so I snap a, a picture of my little camera and I started following them, see where they were going. I mean, obviously they're going to get their water. They got these buckets. So literally like four or five hours later, I arrive at this water source that they're getting, and the water they're getting looks, you could probably tell by their buckets, looks more like the coffee that you drank this morning. And then they walk hours back. And then those mothers are forced to give their youngest kids that we would never think to give anything other than the nicest quality, you know, water or juice or milk. That's what they have to give their kids. And so it's no wonder why the number one cause of death in this camp and all throughout Darfur is diseases related to their water. So I decided I needed to do something to help them out. Uh, I didn't know, I didn't have access to a really expensive drilling machine like a lot of these other groups. So in the beginning, we put a big water tank in the middle. Uh, I found a local truck and we put a big, uh, we welded a big tank on the back of that truck and we would drive to the nearest clean water source every single day uh, that we can find and fill this tank up for all these people. And so now these kids and these women, uh, they just walk a few minutes, three, four, five minutes to get their water instead of three, four, five hours. And that was important on two fronts. One. It allowed these kids, uh, I had a good buddy of mine that started working with me, he was able to help open up a school there. So it, it freed up time for the kids to start going to school. So they got to start getting the education. They weren't walking all day long to get their water. Two, it helped uh, keep the, the children from getting sick in this area, from the water, because we were getting clean water. And a big thing is that in a genocide situation, you don't want people walking out of their camp. They live in these camps because the rebels that I'm getting ready to talk about in a minute, they offered some protection. They were fighting back against the government. But they only had so much protection they can offer. And when you're a group of women and kids walking hours out in the desert to try to find water, that's when bad things happen to women and kids. So it really helped in a lot of fronts to be able to do that. Uh, I worked with them for about a month until I finally was able to partner with a group that had a drilling machine that was going to come and drill us a well right in the middle of that camp. So I was getting really excited to see the change that, that giving clean water had on a community like Marla. It changed everything for them. The kids were getting healthy. They were getting education. It was, it was all exciting. Um, and right when we were getting ready to send this drilling machine out to drill a well right in the middle of that camp uh, to have more sustainable clean water that would last a long time, um, the government found out the location. Uh, they came out. They came with their helicopter gunships and they bombed the whole camp. Um, they they uh, came in and they shot up our water tank with their machine guns. They found the driver of my truck and they they beat him almost to death. And they ended up killing a lot of the people that I had gotten to know there um, and built relationships with. And and, uh, and that's when I realized that my first month, you know, I had 11 more to go that this was not going to be um, as maybe as easy as I had, had hoped it would be. Um, but I continued to work after that, and the, the group that I worked with the most are these guys here. Uh, they were the ones that had control over Marla Camp, uh, were trying to continue to protect it. Um, they're the rebels. You can look at them as the good guys because they're fighting back against the government like, for all their atrocities. The problem with looking at them as the good guys is that they actually, they actually killed just as many humanitarian aid workers, such as myself, or kidnapped them, as did the bad guys, because they didn't trust anyone. 
So instead of trying to deal with, is this person a spy from the government or not a spy from the government, they just kidnap you or shoot you. They don't, there's no law there in Darfur. So they had no one to answer to. And it was just easier that way. Um, but then I started noticing how a lot of organizations worked, how they, let's say it's a food group, they'd come in to near one of these rebel areas and they'd kick food off the back of a truck for thousands of people as fast as they could and pow, they were out of there. Or if it's a well drilling group, same thing. They go pop a well on the ground, pow, they were out of there. And I started watching this a little bit and I'm like, you know, I don't have all the degrees in international policy and masters and doctorates that a lot of these other folks that run these organizations have. But to me, it was just common sense. Of course they don't trust us. Because from what I can tell, no one's ever actually taken the time to build a relationship with these guys and get to know them. So of course they don't trust, trust us. Um, and so I decided to try something a little different. For me, it was a concept I learned just simply as a bartender. It didn't matter how fast I made someone's mojito and slid it across the bar to have a nice day and walked away. That's not why I love my job. That's not what made me what I thought a good bartender. Because I was actually, if you look at it that way, I was a terrible bartender. I was a lot slower than everybody else at making the drink and I always got it wrong. I never knew how much mint to put in a mojito. And I never knew, was it really rum or was it vodka? They're both clear, for God's sakes. I don't know. You know, I was terrible at that kind of stuff. But that's not why I love my job and that's not why people came to hang out. They came for conversation. They came because I decided to look at my job as more than just serving drinks. I looked at it as a chance to build relationships with people. And I loved it. So maybe I can translate that to this. Um, and, and so I did something a little different. I went to this first rebel group. They're called the JEM, the Joint Equality Movement. And I remember I would go straight up to the guy, two to the left of me. He's the commander, you can tell, because he's got this big thing hanging around his neck. It's a satellite phone, a Thuraya. And I went straight up to him and I said something like, you know, Assalamu alaikum, alhamdulillah, ana doc. You know, I'd go through Arabic I had learned, and then my translator, like, hurting to get over to start talking. And th so through my translator, I'd say something like, you know, can we, is it cool if I go with you to the market and share some coffee or a meal? Uh, actually, it's cool. I got nowhere to go. You know, I don't have anywhere to be. I'd love to come to your village where you're from, meet your wife and your kids, and hang out for a few days, for a week. I don't care. I don't have anywhere to go. And you see this rebel leader kind of look at all his guys and all their guns and little old me and my couple guys, no guns. And they're like, nam, nam, shukran, jizera. You know, yes, yes, thank you very much. This big, bright, white smile. Next thing you know, we're hopping in trucks and we're following these guys and their machine guns. And a few hours later, we're all slaughtering a goat and uh, having a big feast later that evening. And it wasn't a few hours later that I'm seeing this guy change from this. And then you meet his wife. Then you meet his kids and you see him turn into a father, into a husband, into just a real person, just like me. Not just some scary looking rebel leader. And I would realize that that's all it would take really, is just to sit down and share a meal and get to know these guys as, as people. Just like you and me. That's all it would take to break down those barriers. And next thing I know, he's picking up that phone, he's calling another area, uh, some other rebel leader saying, hey, there's this guy, he's going to come and he's not going to leave, he's going to stay. Uh, make sure you don't shoot him uh, and <laughs> let him in and he's going to work. He wants to help us get water. And that would spread. That he would call the next guy. And I was able to go and work in areas uh, that the United Nations didn't even have access to um, because of the relationships that I was able to establish there and because of the concept that it's not just the work that we were there to do that's important. It's just as important, if not more important, to focus on building relationships with these guys first and foremost. And so I got excited. I was allowed to work, like I said, in, in a lot of areas that no one else was able to work in. And uh, I was doing this kind of work here. I'd never really had the money to have a nice, expensive drilling machine. Um, but I did some research and I found out that over 60% of the wells in Sub-Saharan Africa are broken. They're not working. So I started going around and getting real excited. Uh, I had a group, of t a team of guys. We got some tools. And I thought, well, I bet we can fix these broken wells. So we pulled the guts out. Sure enough, every time the pump would be soaking wet. I was thinking maybe the wells had just dried up. There's water there every time. And then we'd look and there would be some little small piece missing or broken or some pipe had been corroded and had a hole in it so it was losing pressure. So we'd change the pipe and the piece, sometimes 40, 50 bucks. We could have a brand new well working again when it costs about eight to $10,000 to put a really brand new well in. But there was other organizations with their hundreds and thousand dollars drilling machines going around putting eight to 10,000 dollar wells all over the place and I'm able to have the same impact for 50 bucks. And then right when we fixed that well, you'd see a whole village start to spring up around it and people living around that water source for a fraction of the cost. So I got really excited, fixed hundreds of wells all over the desert. And it, 
then it kind of hit me at some point, pretty late in my time there, unfortunately, but I, it hit me that, well, geez, what am I even doing here? What's the point? Because these wells that I've just gone through and fixed and patted myself on the back and thought like I did such a great job, they're just going to break again in a few years. And then who's going to be here to fix them then? Are they going to wait on me to come back and rescue them or someone else from America to come save the day? You know, so at the end of my time there, I decided, well, what if we were to bring extra toolkits? And what if we were to bring along the locals there and teach and train them how to fix their own wells and leave them with the resources, the training, and the tools necessary to fix their own problems? Wouldn't that make more sense than us just doing it for them? You know, teach them how to access their own needs and their own resources. So uh, we did that. And when I saw what that would do to a community, when you empowered them to take care of their own problems, it changed everything for me. I got super excited, and I had this vision now. Like, I wanted to come home, and I wanted to do that in other countries around the world. Go around to other countries and teach people how to access their own clean water instead of always relying on America or someone from the West to come and save the day. You know, that was my idea. And so I was excited to come back. I was looking forward to it. There was a couple things that... I, I think maybe I needed to go through before that could happen. Uh, one of them, I was coming from one of the rebel areas called Jebel Mara, uh, which in the local language means the Bad Mountains. I was coming from there, it's a volcanic region, uh, and I was coming back to our home base, which was in another uh, part of Darfur, and in between that drive, uh, it's a four or five hour drive, and right in the middle of it there was an area that was held by the bad guys, which the locals called them the Janjaweed, which means in the local language it means evil horsemen. Uh, they're the group that was funded by the government to do all this killing and I had to drive through one of their areas and I'd run into them before. Uh, when I'd run into them, they'd jump in the middle of the road, they'd shoot off their guns, they'd stop us. I've had them steal our stuff, beat my man in front of me, sometimes strip them down naked to humiliate them. Like we've had stuff happen that wasn't good. Um, but they'd always jump in the road, shoot off, do that stuff and then they'd let us go. This one day I was driving back through one of these areas that normally is a ghost town, there was never anybody there. And the day I was driving through, I noticed there were some people back on horses and camels. And then as I got closer to the village, I noticed two or three guys hidden behind trees and rocks like with their guns like this. And on this side, another two or three. And I'm kind of thinking like, okay, what do I need to do? Do I need to stop and talk to these guys and reason with them? Or do I need to just go? Because normally they jump in the road and stop me. Why are they hidden? You know, so I'm kind of thinking back and forth, what do I do? And finally, my gut just kind of answered and it said, you know, like, go, man. So I just hit the gas. And right when I did, I was driving the lead vehicle. I had my window down, my arm hanging out the window. I hit the gas. And right when I did, the guy right here to the left of me, uh, he shot his gun. And I could feel the blast from that gun, the heat and the shock wave from the barrel. And, uh, and then they all started shooting. These two guys shot. These guys over here started shooting. The bullets were whizzing by. I could hear them smashing through the windows and just tearing through the metal of the truck. Um, my guys in the radio behind me were, were up like, you know, the giga, the giga, we need to stop. Uh, they're telling me their tires have been, been blown out. Um, and I'm like, no, man, I'm trying to tell them, you know, Hamza the guy, you gotta go five more kilometers, five more, then we can stop. Because my thought was if we go five more, we outrun their horses and camels enough to change the tire and leave. So they agreed and they kind of limped on the rim five more kilometers. And, um, you know, being from North Carolina, I'm sure some of y'all are, are NASCAR fans. Um, <laughs> We changed that tire and that vehicle in a way that would have made the most well-oiled pit crews extremely jealous. Um, we just had a little, you know, tr tire iron that looks like that. And we didn't have one of those, boop, 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 boop. You know, we, we had that thing off, on, and ready to roll in no time. And so I had a little bit of time because I was looking at my vehicle, too, to kind of check and make sure that it could still drive. So I'm looking at the bullet holes, and one, um, the gas tank was just pouring out of this one gas tank. And, um, and it had two, I had a Land Cruiser, it had two gas tanks on it, thank goodness. So I switched over to the good tank, and I'm looking at the bullet holes before I hop in the truck to make sure I can still drive. And there was one that caught my eye before I left. And it, it had gone in the back window. They were all shooting at me because I was driving the lead vehicle, so they are all kind of trying to hit me in the head. And this one bullet had gone in the back of the window, and I could see the trajectory and the path of the bullet because I had a big cardboard box that was holding chlorine tablets behind my seat, right behind my head. And you could see the bullet, it went through the window, and it was skimming across the top of that box in a straight line, headed right from my head, and I'm like, <laughs> beyond. And then right before it got to my head on that box, you see it took a 90 degree turn and went that way, on the box. You could see the line, so I was kind of like, 
like, and I, again, I'm from the south. I shoot guns. I hunt. And I've never shot a gun and seen the bullet go like this. They go straight. So I'm like, that doesn't... Sure enough, I drew the line to the wall of the truck. And I went and there was a hole right there. And I could dig the bullet out of the side of the truck. And I kept it with me for a long time after that because there was something, I don't know about that, that made me feel like that, you know, maybe for the first time in my life I was on the right track. You know, maybe somebody was, was looking out for me. And, um, and so I kept, even after that, I kept working. Uh, the United Nations was great. They um, um, began to airlift me in so I didn't have to drive through that area back to Jebel Mara. And they would drop me off in the mountains and my guys would, I would call ahead and they would have horses and camels waiting on me for us to travel through there. So I kept working to finish my time. And uh, about two weeks before I was left, my guys were uh, getting excited to, to kind of send me off and have a big feast and a fun time for me to leave. Um, and they were all shut into work one day, excited to go out and do some work. And uh, they all came in except for one, and uh, my friend Ismail, and he's never late. So I started getting a little worried. And his brother shows up instead, and he comes, he grabs me by the hand, and his English isn't good, so he just said, you know, you come with me. So he grabs my hand and takes me to the end of our, our village there where everyone buries their dead. And next thing I know, his fra father and his brothers were asking me to help. And I'm picking up my friend Ismail who's wrapped in linen. Um, and then next thing, his father hands me a shovel and they're teaching me how to dig uh, a grave according to Islamic law. You go down three feet and then you make a really small slit, another three feet, so that you can put the body in on its side so it's facing east towards Mecca. And um, and one, I was really, it was all kind of a blur that day, but I was really honored that they would ask me to be involved in that because I'm, I'm very honest and open about where I come from and the things that, that I believe and, and that kind of stuff. And, uh, but I loved my guys regardless. I would never expect them to see things the way I see things and they would never expect me to see things the way they see things. And we had this mutual love and respect for each other so that the fact that they would allow me to be a part of, of such a sacred thing to them was a huge honor uh, for me. And, um, and so I did. I hopped in the grave and, and helped him dig. And then my, uh, his brother explained through my translator, this is what happened. And I found out that John Jewid had pulled over his bus on the way into work that morning and, uh, and pulled everybody off and questioned him, let everybody back on the bus except for my friend Ismail. And they put him on his face and they shot him in the head. And the um, only thing I, I... I don't know what they asked him. I have no idea. But I couldn't get it out of my head that... that you know, maybe they found out he was one of my guys from before, and uh, and and so they killed him, and 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 I couldn't get that off of out of my head when it was time for me to leave and come home, because um, he had a wife and kids, and and I had nobody. I didn't, I wasn't married at the time, and I didn't have any kids, so I was like, why? <laughs> why did he not make it out of here when he had so much to lose, and I had nothing to lose? Why did I make it out of Darfur? And so I'd love to tell y'all that I came back super excited, ready to take on the world and start Wanda Water. Um, as you can see, it was a pretty difficult thing for me to deal with. And um, to be honest, I was ready to call it quits and throw in the towel when I, when I came home. I was ready just to, to walk. Um, and I would have had, had I not met my wife. Uh, I met her about three days after coming home uh, from Darfur. Uh, I met her in a bar, of course. Um, <laughs> I got home and I was obviously craving a cold beer and, uh, and some good old live music. Sure enough, there just happened to be this Leonard Skinner cover band playing there locally. And I don't know if any of y'all noticed, but if you've ever been in a bar and you're weird like me, um, your beer can actually really miraculously turn into a microphone. You know, it really, it does, it does really well, especially if you're lonely. And, uh, so I found the darkest corner of the bar that I could find. I didn't want to talk to nobody. I was being that emo guy in the corner. And my drink had just turned into a microphone and Freebird had just come on. So I'm like, I'm as free as a bird now. Being that really weird guy in the corner singing to himself <laughs> that nobody wants to talk to, and, uh, which is fine. So I was over there. And next thing I know, I look up and the door of the place on the opposite end swings open. And this whole group of smoking hot girls walked in the bar. And I was like, whoa. I mean, I'd been in the desert for a year, for God's sake. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. But then I realized, like every guy in this room will tell you, you never hit on a girl in a pack of girls. Because they're like a pack of wolves, man. They will tear you apart. So I was like, whoa. I'm as free as a bird. Yeah, I went right back to singing my song. And next thing I know, I get a tap on my shoulder. I look over. 
and it's the smokiest, hottest one, and the whole group had come up to me, tapped me on the shoulder, stuck out her hand, and she said, hi, my name's, my name's Amber, what's your name? And I'm like, oh, I gotta try to cool down a little bit, lower my voice a little bit, and I'm like, hi, oh, oh, my, name's, my name's Doc. It's nice to meet you, Amber. And she's like, oh, Doc, is, is, that, your, is that your real name? Are you, are you a doctor? And I'm like, yeah, no, no. <laughs> Just call me Doc. Everybody calls me Doc. N nice to meet you, Amber. She's like, oh, well, 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 then what's your real name? And I'm like, D -d -d Doc. Just call me Doc. And she did one of these. She was like, what is your real name? And I'm like, lady, I just met you. How can you be demanding my real name, for God's sake? So I'm I was already starting to lose cool points at this point. Uh, and I'm like, oh, gosh. All right, look. When I was born, my, my parents, my family, they, they named me Dixon. That, it's a family name. My granddaddy was named that. His daddy was named that all the way back. So I'm, my real name's Dixon. Um, but my sister, who was two years older than me when I was born, she was just learning to talk, and she couldn't pronounce Dixon, so she called me Dick Doc, okay? <laughs> so for an ungodly amount of time, my family referred to me as Dick Doc, and um, somewhere along the way, they cut the dick off and they left the doc. <laughs> And that's how I got Doc. Like, lady, this is not a great story here, you know. <laughs> she just laughed and she's like, well, I like Dixon better. I'm going to call you that. And, uh, and we hit it off really well, you know, from the beginning. Um, but one of the most beautiful things about her, you know, other than what she had to offer on the outside is what she had to, to give on the inside. Um, and for me, it's... It was... I had no end in sight to to what I was dealing with. I was ready to throw in the towel, like I said. Um, but for me, she had the ability to make me believe in myself when I had absolutely nothing to offer. And I know y'all have these too. I, have, I had days, even after I picked myself back up, it took me almost a year, even if, after I had days where I felt like I, could, I think I could do this, and she would encourage me, there were still days I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. There were days, honestly, harder than the times in Darfur. Sometimes tangible things that, that, that are afraid, that make you afraid and that are, that are hard to deal with. Sometimes those things are easier to deal with than like when we decided to file for our charity status. And for months, I'm filling out paperwork that's like this high because I couldn't afford a lawyer. And then you send it in and they send it back to you because you didn't sign this thing right. And you send it back in. And so many days I was ready to be done. And I just didn't want to get out of bed anymore because I, I just couldn't do this. She was right there to pull me along, to encourage me, and keep me going. And I wouldn't be here, none of this would be here without, without that type of relationship that, that we have. And because of that, we were able to continue to, to grow the organization uh, pretty quickly after I finally was able to kind of pull myself together, thanks to her. Uh, we moved to Ethiopia here, you'll see. Um, I met a group of orphans in Ethiopia, <laughs> all those guys there minus the one in the back, went to the same orphanage together. And uh, they decided we don't want to be adopted out all around the world. We just want to stay here and make our country better. So they studied engineering and they found this contraption that they made up uh, out of parts out of the, the dump. That thing I'm holding in my hand is the axle of a broken down truck. They got some pulleys and some ropes and they made a well digging machine that didn't require any motor or, or gas or anything or those explosions. Uh, they didn't it didn't require anything. All it required was manpower just to go back and forth and every single day with that machine they can hammer a hole into the ground without an expensive hundred thousand dollar machine and then to get the water to the top they'd use broken down bicycle parts the wheels and the pedals and the rope system and they would just uh, use that as to create a pump to get the water out so for a fraction of the cost they were making these wells to get the water to the surface whereas the other organizations it was thousands and thousands of dollars so I'm like, that's exactly the kind of stuff that, that we want to support. Uh, after that, I met a guy in Cambodia who had started a, a small Cambodian organization to help the children. And I convinced him to start doing water programs with us because I'm like, look, you know as well as I do, water is the biggest crisis here in Cambodia for the kids especially. So he agreed to help me. We started digging wells the way everybody else did, the only way we knew how at the beginning. Uh, you know, it cost us about $2,500 a piece with the expensive machines and expensive pumps. And then he calls me one day and he's like, you know, I've seen this tractor in the market. I think we can turn it into a drilling machine that we can use. And it's all made from local parts. And I'm like, let's do it. And also the pumps that we bring the water out to the top, they're really expensive. They come from India. When they break, we have to wait for the parts to come in. I think we can make them out of our own parts in the market. I'm like, let's do it. So it took me about three months to, to, to get it going. 
And you see this machine here, this one of the ones we use, we've got two now. Um, and I'm not going to lie, the thing is a piece of breaks down like twice a month. But it's okay, they just hop on their little scooter and wee, and they go off to the market. <laughs> And they get this little rubber seal or some pump or whatever, and they replace it. And then a few dollars later, it's up and going again. And with that and the pumps that we use, we've now, uh, we've, we just drilled our 600th well at the end of last year in Cambodia. And we're drilling wells for five times less the cost of everybody else. Everybody else is between $2,500, sometimes $5,000. We're less than 500 bucks a piece for every single well we drill local materials, local people, and we found that our wells last just as long as the expensive ones. And the great thing is when they break, the, at the school or the orphanage, the headmaster can just go, lop off the top of this one pump, go right to the market, get another one for just pennies on the dollar, put it on top, and there it goes again. Same thing. So it's much more sustainable and much cheaper. So I got excited. We're traveling all over, and I found in Uganda there's areas that don't need wells. They have plenty of water. North of Uganda is where the Nile River starts but they just need that water cleaned, it's dirty. So I found these guys making water filters and uh, those, those things there are called biosan filters. We make them for less than $100 a piece and distribute them and teach people how to use them for that. And so you can put one in an orphanage of 100 kids, let's say, and it'll clean water for 100 children for 10 years with little to no maintenance. All you gotta do is sift the bacteria off the top once it gathers at the top uh, every, every couple weeks. And, and so for less than a dollar per child, we can provide them with clean water for 10 years. So I got excited from there. I'm still moving around the world. And uh, Haiti is kind of the last place I'll talk about where uh, another form of filter I found from a lady in the Dominican Republic who was passionate about pottery and clay. Um, and, and she just uh, found a way through making a clay pot that you could mix sawdust in with the clay and fire in, in a kiln. And that sawdust burns up uh, in the clay mixture and leaves very tiny porous holes uh, around 0.1 to 0.2 microns in size that you can't see, but it's enough for the water to slowly trickle through and capture bacteria in the clay. And then she added on another component uh, of really small amount of fine grained silver that she can find and she mixes it with a liquid solution then mixes that in with the clay and that silver adds a whole other layer of protection. Y'all may know silver, it causes the molecules to ionize and you'll lose an electron and it'll shoot off and it'll render that bacteria useless that's trying to pass through there if it does make it. So because of that we're able to get 99.9% .9 clean water for five years out of one of those things. Each one costs us between $30, $35 to make and distribute and so after the earthquake like this family here, they lost everything. I met them right after the earthquake. They were living on the street in front of their old house right there. And they lived right there. And the water they got was running through the gutter of the street that they were living on. And they got that water out. And that's what they had for their family. We could take that filter. They could take the same water right out of the gutter that's been running through God knows what in Haiti. Put it in that filter and get 99.9% .9 clean water out of there for a fraction of the cost of what the other solutions were. So we brought over 2,000 of those filters. Uh, and then... After about 2000, I asked the lady if she would help me um, teach and train a group of local Haitians how to, to do what she does. Because the whole point is to make it sustainable. So she agreed, and uh, as of November two years ago, so about two years and three months or so, uh, we started our own Haitian water filter factory there in Haiti. They build between 700 and 1,000 water filters every single month. Uh, right now, and we've uh, now built up, uh, about 20,000, over 20,000 water filters out of that factory alone, run by Haitians, using Haitian materials to do that work. And I look back at, at this, and, uh, and, and even all the places I've been since then, uh, since Haiti, I've been to some other pretty bad areas. I said before, the Philippines after the typhoon there was a pretty difficult spot, and a pretty major disaster, and even I was in Syria last year after the war got really bad. Um, providing water filters there, and, and I've seen a lot of stuff. I've seen a lot of bad places. Um, and this last picture I want to show you kind of really, I think, helps sums up the last decade of my life since all this got started. Because a lot of people will ask me, in all your travels, all what you see, you, you've seen a lot. And, and gosh, I guess it must be so difficult to see people that are struggling and suffering and, and hurting so much, and what do you see? And this last picture I want to show you, I really feel like sums up all of what I feel about my last 10 years. Um, I took this picture in one of the worst slums I had been in uh, outside of Kampala, Uganda. Um, this woman and her child, they lived basically in a trash dump. They right in the middle of where the town dumped their trash and the water that they got was a little stream that ran right through the middle of the trash dump. Um, and they had nothing. They had less than nothing according to our standards. Yet when 
when I travel to these areas like that, or like Syria or Darfur, this is what I see. Not what people think, the kids with the flies in their face and they're just so sad. And I mean, you see that a little bit, but I feel like so much here in the West, uh, organizations will take pictures of that and use that to try to make us feel guilty, to make you give your money. This, you know, this, these people are miserable. The truth, that's not the truth. This is what I see when I travel to some of the worst places in the world. And so I feel like, if I'm honest with y'all, and I look at this, I feel like there are a lot of people say, y'all, you must feel good and sleep good at night. You've given so many people so much stuff, so much water and, and wells. And, and that's not what I think about when I think about my last 10 years. I, I, I feel like, honestly, that they have given me infinitely more than I've ever been able to give them and taught me infinitely more about life than I've ever been able to teach them because of this right here. And really, if I'm really honest with y'all, you know, yes, I'm passionate about water. I feel like, in a strange way, water kind of found me 10 years ago. But if I'm really honest, I feel like I became passionate even before water about something much more important. Uh, and it started in the bars. I, I, became, I became passionate about people. And water is just the outcome. Water is just the... the, the the resource that comes from that passion. But what I'm really, truly passionate about is people. And it started a long time ago in a little Irish pub. And for me, what I, what I really get excited about doing is having this opportunity because I don't think we're supposed to all quit our jobs and go join the Peace Corps and move to the Amazon or Africa to, to have an impact on the world. If we did that, our own economy would collapse and we'd have to come back and help ourselves one day. So that's not the answer. The answer is right in front of us every single day. With what you do, especially with your job, you have a chance to change people's lives with your job. You deal with people on a daily basis, and you have a chance to, to make them walk away from a meeting or an experience going, wow, I want to change the way I do things. I want to change the way that I look at life in general. That is a huge resource to have at your fingertips. And I want to encourage you all that to... It's not just about the bottom line. It's not just about the meetings and the, and the, and the money. And I think that y'all are probably not in this because of that. I'm pretty sure y'all didn't get in this one day thinking, I'm going to be in the media industry because I want a jet. I want my own personal yacht. You know, you didn't get in this because of that. You got in this, I got a feeling, because you love people as well. And you love to see people smile just like that after an experience. So I want to encourage y'all that to, to use the resources you have at your fingertips to just try to love on people and encourage them and build relationships with people that you might never have had the opportunity to do. And to me, that's what this life's all about. That's why I love what I do. So y'all, God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for, for having me today. What an inspiration. Thank you so much, Doc. It's a very moving story, and uh, One Smart Meetings is very proud to, uh, to have put on the cover of our magazine and to have you here today and hope to continue to support your organization. and all the good that you do, so thank you.